Good afternoon, Dr. Oxley. I'm um, Rodrigo Rivera from, I'm working now, working in Chile, in Santiago, and, and work for the Lincoln Line. I'm the editor of the Lincoln Line. And thank you for your time. Thank you for being here today with us. Uh, please, we are very delighted with your work and congratulations in the first place. Thank and you. And we want to hear from you, your experience uh, in first place. What are you, where are you now? Where, where do you work and what is, what is your team? Hmm. So, um, by training, I'm an Australian neurologist, and then I did a stroke fellowship in um, Royal Melbourne Hospital uh, with Bruce Campbell and Stephen Davis. And um, I then started a PhD um, back in 2012, a long time ago. I then moved over to um, New York to work under Jay Mocko um, in the endovascular team and did my interventional neurology fellowship, which I finished in 2017. But in the background, I've been working on this technology for some time. And so we've, been, we've spent years in the animal model um, trying to prove that we could build um, a stent that had electrodes on the stent which could um, stay inside a blood vessel and record electrocorticography over a long period of time with the ultimate intention of uh, recording motor cortex signal in patients who are paralyzed to then use that signal in a way that can control systems that improve um, functional independence. Fantastic, fantastic, great. From, from conception to human use, how, many, how much time do you, do you is, is the total amount of time that you, you wait to use for that? Mm. Uh, well, my PhD started in 2012 and that's when we had our first grant. Um, we published our animal study in Nature Biotechnology in 2016. And then we have just published our first human work uh, in 2020. So I guess it's four years plus four years, four years preclinical to then to get to four years to clinical. Um, and now we are beginning to focus on FDA approval in the USA um, over the next several years. So we would, we'd hope in the next four years to be um, well on our way with a with a pivotal study demonstrating the safety and effectiveness of the technology, hopingly hoping to then get approval um, in the U.S. So, which were the, the the biggest difficulties you found in in this way up to, up to now for product, for producing this device? Mm. I think there have been decades of use, um, dec decades of um, examples of brain computer interfaces that have traditionally required craniotomy. And I think, and you know, despite the science being around for decades of use, there's been um, slow progression into the clinical space. I personally think that the endovascular solution overcomes a lot of the challenges that this space has um, had problems with. And we're not claiming that the signal quality um, when you record electrocorticography from a blood vessel is higher than when you do an invasive electrode via craniotomy. But we think that you can get a good enough signal from the blood vessel to deliver a control system that is very useful for patients who are paralyzed. Therefore, um, the commercial application I think is, is significant. Um, which is good for patients. And so I think, I think the biggest problem um, that we've overcome is to deliver a fully implantable system. That's what's been missing in this space. Fully implantable system that can go home with the patient and immediately interact with their technology at home to give them a control mechanism. In, in this same uh, um, team, the, the I read in some of some some part of the press that they, they call it this um this is a mind control device. Do you do, do you agree with that? This, and how what is important for the for the medical field that we have something that you can you can manage with the with 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 the, with the mind. Yeah, I mean, for for people who are paralyzed, um, they have poor control over technology systems, and so. It is the mind control. I mean, um, 
what the system intends to do is to restore the lost ability of the transmission of motor impulses out of the motor cortex, out of the brain. And so the word control um, relates to intention or volition or, you know, wanting to do something. And yes, so it's a brain implant and a control is a critical element because the people learn how to exert intention from the motor cortex to then control a system. So that is true, but mind control um, is a scary term for many people. It sounds like there's control of the mind, but it's not. It's going in the opposite direction. The brain exerts its control on an external system. There's no uh, control coming in the other way. Yeah. What was the, when you, when you saw the patients uh, doing this new task, what were the reactions? In the, in yeah. The there was an incredible moment with our first patient when he, he typed out his very first sentence. And I think the best way to describe it is if you've ever had that experience in your life where you have um, figured out how to use a technology that opens up a world of possibilities that weren't there before, learning how to ride a bike, learning how to drive a car, you, your mind expands out because suddenly there are a range of things that you can do that you could not do before. I think for people who suffer paralysis, you go from having that to then down to a much smaller world where you cannot do the things that you used to do. I think the brain computer interface opens that up a little bit more um, and seeing his ability to then control. And the main thing that he wanted to do was just to be able to send a text message to his wife because by being able to text message his wife, she can leave the room, which she couldn't do before. So th those things we take for granted, I think. Great. Are you foreseeing uh, now, what is the, what are the steps? Are you foreseeing a trial with, with the, the device? Uh, more and more patients? Yeah, so we have an ongoing feasibility study in Australia and ultimately um, success will uh, require FDA approval so that we can begin um, offering the technology more broadly. So the trial that we think will need to happen to get FDA approval is about a 100, maybe 120 patient pivotal study, which we'd like to perform um, probably a worldwide study. And we're currently uh, um, optimizing the clinical protocol in the feasibility study in Australia and in the US to then launch that study. We'd hope to launch that study by within two years. So, so now you're using the, the, the motor cortex uh, information. Do you think that future devices, endovascular devices, can uh, reach other information from the, from the, near, the nearby, uh, from, from the, the environment? For example, if the standards can be transmitted in, in, in life, uh, the flow, the pressure of the, of the, the, the blood. Mm. Do you foresee so something like that with this? Um, I think, I think the next step for us will be stimulation. So, um, neuromodulation applications like deep brain stimulation or some other targets around the body, um, or in the head and the neck that, uh, no longer will require open surgery. I think from, I think from an interventional perspective or endovascular perspective, there is huge potential moving into neuromodulation. And so we, we uh, in the next couple of years, would like to launch a first in human study of the first neuromodulation application. Um, that will probably be the next step. Great. Do you think that, that arteries can also be a, a way of reaching the, the brain or you, 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 you see that veins are the other place to, to be? Actually, arteries, arteries are great. Um, as we're starting out, there's a concern over the risks with this technology that um, moving into the arterial tree versus the venous tree increases that risk profile substantially because of stroke as a complication of thrombosis. Whereas with, with venous thrombosis, obviously that's also concerning, but with a less lower degree of risk. The other issue is um, the the arterial tree becomes smaller and smaller as you get closer to the cortical surface. And so access to the cortical surface from a, um, 
certainly internal carotid artery supply is challenging. There are some external carotid artery supplies that might be attractive, but then you still have a lead crossing um, at least into the common carotid artery, which still generates some risk. Um, so yeah, I think, I think in the future, there are definitely arterial um, targets, uh, but we, we think the venous is a very attractive place to start from a safety profile. And, and to be uh, dependent with a, with a lead, is, is going to be a, the future, uh, some devices that don't need a, any lead, for example? Yeah, yeah, we would love to not have a lead. It, it creates a significant uh, wireless powering problem. Um, you either have to put the battery right next to the stent, or if you have to generate power, you have to come through the skull. Um, we would like to move towards that. And once, if you, can if you can remove the lead, you can substantially increase the number of electrodes and have more channels, but you have to solve the powering problem. And then um, you then get onto a wearable issue. So you'd have to have a device up in the head somewhere that's going to generate power or have a wearable that can deliver power. But by having a device in the chest, we can use technology that's pre-existed that solves a lot of these problems. So there's an advantage to starting here. Ultimately, yes, I think um, in future iterations, we'll see, we'll see uh, chips and powering solutions directly all in the brain with no lead. Perfect. Dr. Oxley, do you want to add anything about that we should know about your experience? No, I think um, yeah. we're excited about um, rolling out this technology. I think, I think one thing from, from this emerging space that's going to be a bit different for interventionalists is that, um, you know, we typically do access from the femoral artery or femoral vein or now a lot from the radial. And there's some transcarotid work, but our first work is now transjugular. And it also results in some requirement to do some tunneling under the skin to then put in a pocket here. And so I guess one interesting aspect of what we're hoping to achieve is that the interventional neuroradiologists or interventional neurologists or um, um, uh, endovascular neurosurgeons can all do the procedure completely on their own, which is what happened with interventional cardiology and electrophysiology. So um, it will be a new approach and create some new challenges, but I think moving into the interventional electrophysiology space is going to be very exciting for the field over the next you know, 15, 20 years. Thank you. One, one final question. Uh, you say in your paper that the uh, patients were, were less uh, need, need for care caregivers to, to help them with the devices as, as, as in the past, where we a lot of external electrodes. So in this case, they can be, they were easy to, to manage at home. Yeah, so our system, there's no battery. So the power comes from the outside, but what we've built is, I don't know, it's about the size of an iPhone, you know, these, these headphone cases and it just, it clips onto the chest. And as soon as it does that, it's then talking to the computer and the system just switches on. So there's no setup. It's kind of like, it's kind of like taking a wireless mouse. You move it and you can see the cursor and it's suddenly talking to the computer. That's the vision for what we're doing. You put it on, the computer turns on and suddenly you're connected and moving with the computer. So that's, that's what we're hoping to, to offer in the first technology. And then batteries, it, it's charged from, its, from, from the outside. From it's charged from the outside, outside, yeah. Great. Yeah. So congratulations, Thomas. Thank you for, for your time. And, and, and your explanation of the, for us, is, uh, it's an honor to, to hear from you directly, your experience. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I, I hope we can do it in person again sometime soon. Yeah, would be great.